uh, I also used to have an expensive hobby, which is uh, photography. And uh, um, like him, I was actually looking around. And uh, my look around was always for details. Uh, therefore, uh, my, my focus was on macros. Um, but then for you to shoot macros, you got to go to places where you find them, uh, especially small flowers or insects. So in many countries, I ended up actually landing into agriculture lands. And that's so, I started to understand what agriculture was. And then when I was traveling in places like, let's say, Italy, Spain, and, uh, uh, and Netherlands or Israel, I started finding something very interesting, which is when we talk about, yeah. so when we talk about uh, uh, an Indian farmer, just to give you some numbers so that you understand. Uh, we went to a place called Udmalpet, which is very close uh, from here. And we uh, spoke with the farmers over there. And we asked them, what crops do you grow? So mo I mean, you have around, I think, uh, 2,000 or 3,000 acres of coconuts. And then the rest of them grow uh, tomatoes and brinjals and chilies that we get in the local mandis. And their major crop happens to be tomato. So we asked them, so how much do you get per acre, per, year, uh, per crop, they said, most of them said, in fact, four to five tons. OK, good. And then we traveled to Hozur, which is supposed to be the largest uh, tomato uh, producing belt of Tamil Nadu. Then we asked them the same question. The answer was somewhere between 20 and 24. Oh, OK. So four, five, and 20, 25. And then we were trying to search for the, for the best place in India that produces uh, tomatoes. Then we traveled to Nasik. So we started asking farmers in Nasik, how, much, how many tons do you get per acre? So the answer was, um, we somehow managed to get at least 90 tons. And then if you're lucky, sometimes we get up to 120, 150. Oh, wow. OK. So then you know, we started, uh, uh, having come from the corporate background, we started then doing all the data analysis and, and trying to figure out um, uh, 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 why three different places in India with uh, three different numbers. And the two, I mean, the, the, uh, there is no comparison between any of them. Where is five? Where is 120, right? And then we started looking around to the rest of the world. Uh, for example, you go to Israel. And again, we in fact picked that one crop and we stuck to that. And we went to Israel. So Israel says about uh, uh, 250 tons easily. Uh, OK, great. And then. Again, to Netherlands, 300 tons, wow. And uh, Thailand, the highest, approximately 430 tons of tomato in one acre of land. And if you again wind back to Udmalpet, anybody remembers how much? Five, right. Now, why does this happen? Why, why does someone get 400 plus and the other person get just five? So then we started getting into the science behind all of that. And just a disclaimer, I have uh, no exposure into agriculture. So just getting into it, again, because of my, um, uh, I mean, uh, just an accidental touch into agriculture, I, I started getting into it. And uh, uh, we did find some experts who could help us with that, uh, both from India and outside India. We started learning about it. So when we started learning about it, what we realized was, Two things, two contrasting things. One, there is a notion among all of us, maybe, that it is better for you to eat organic food um, as naturally grown as possible, right? All of us think that way. And on the other hand, the seeds that you get in the market today are the so-called hybrid. Now, when we went into the science behind all of that, can you really do organic with the hybrid seed? Oh, well, yeah, I can. But then, can I get the potential of uh, the seed? Of course not. So then we started drafting all the observations uh, we had. So uh, then the whole story started in my land. Uh, I had a farmland, and, and we said, OK, let's divide the farm into multiple trial plots. So uh, we had, I think, across 40 acres, around uh, uh, 100 plus trials organic, inorganic, bio, uh, potato, I mean, sorry, not potato, uh, tomato, brinjal, chili, 
I mean, around 20 different varieties split into multiple plots and then uh, started doing, doing experiments. You know, the f very first attempt, uh, the tomato yield in my farm with no prior agricultural background or expertise was about 80 plus tons. Where, uh, whereas uh, just my neighbors, neighboring farms, were at the range of about three tons, three and a half tons. And this, I'm referring to a place in Thirunel Valley, down south in Tamil Nadu. So three, three and a half tons with the same seed, same brand of seed, uh, just about 200 meters away, 80 tons, first attempt. Then we said, wow, so there is something in it. So the science that the Israeli guys are talking about is actually serious. So then we said, okay, why don't we go get some local experts because we, we, we can't uh, always depend on the Israelis, economically not viable. So we started looking around for the so-called experts. Honestly, couldn't find any. Here is where we thought, I mean, why don't we then use some of our past industrial experience into this and do something about it. So what do we do in industry? Develop process around it, develop practices, standardize it. So we started doing standardizing of cultivation practices. Not that there was nobody in India to do it, but I mean, it took uh, uh, you know, some fresh eye maybe to unlearn. I mean, because we, none of us had uh, known anything about agriculture, maybe it was a fresh look. I am not really sure about it. But we started getting a little deeper into it and we documented it. And the fact of the matter is, we were able to replicate. We were able to replicate uh, what we did back in Thirunel Valley into places like, again, in Udmalpet, in uh, Metupalayam, in Uti, in Hosur, in uh, Nasik, and near Bangalore. We were able to replicate this in many different places. And the only difference between what the farmers were doing before and what we started doing then was introducing this concept of precision. So what is precision? Now, coming to that a bit. The plants, for example, if I ask any of you, can you live underwater for, say, two hours? Obviously, no, right? Now, if you look at an average Indian farmer, I mean, if you go to his place where the, the water is plenty, or even this neighborhood where the water is plenty, they just keep the water on all the time. So uh, at least most of the farmers. So what happens is your soil is so wet, and the microbes, the living organisms that are in the soil, really can't breathe. And when they don't breathe, they don't do what they're supposed to do to help the plants to absorb the nutrition. And this is one simple fact that I realized at, at some point that was the most fundamental reason behind the highest yield and the lowest yield. And that is when we decided we, we really have to do something about this. Now I'll run through a couple of slides. <clears throat> so in, in this study, which lasted for, for uh, say, two years, what we really understood was the knowledge about agriculture. So we, have, we carry very rich traditional knowledge about agriculture. There is no second question about it. But the fact is we have, uh, starting maybe 1980s, we have hybrid seeds. Now the hybrid seeds, when they come in to the market, do I apply the same principles and the practices that I did for my traditional seeds that grew in my forest in my backyard on its own? It couldn't be, right? There, there, there's got to be something different. So there was a definitely a lack of knowledge in growing the marketable seeds uh, that we get in the shops today. And the other thing, this is very important, which is a farmer who has a lot of water versus a farmer who has very little water. You know what, what they do? A, a, a farmer with a lot of water, I mean, you, you should just go around, maybe uh, within about a kilometer or two kilometer radius, you will know what a farmer with a lot of water does. And you should go to Tripur to find out what a farmer with no water does, or Pallaram to find out what a farmer with no water does. Uh, there was a farm of about 500 acres in uh, Pallaram, uh, uh, very close to Coimbatore. Because they don't have water, they buy water for uh, around 5,000 rupees a day. They spend about 5,000 rupees a day to get water. You know what they do? They have just secluded 10 acres, and they said, we will just save these 10 acres. So we go to the farm, and what we realized was actually shocking. You know, They irrigate those 10 acres as if they had all the water in the world with the water they bought for 5,000 uh, 5, rupees a day. 
And then he said, you know, uh, you're really doing no good to the plant. Maybe this, is, this water is enough uh, to uh, probably feed about 100 uh, acres. And the, the farmer uh, uh, was in utter disbelief and said, no, you're talking nonsense. And then, but finally he said, I'll give it a shot, maybe five acres, I'll give it a shot with uh, lesser water as you, uh, as you recommended. And you know, those five acres in about two months started performing so much better. Then he said, okay, then now I'll, now, now I'll follow the uh, prescription that you gave. So this over irrigation is not just an issue with uh, water going away from you, but it is also an issue with the farmer not getting the right yield that he is entitled to or maybe expected to get. And the other issue that we have is uh, over fertilization. You know, the farmers get to buy fertilizers from, uh, I mean, the subsidized fertilizers from the local shops, and they go buy. And, and again, going back to this hybrid uh, seed story, the seeds to perform to its potential need a certain calculation. How much nutrition your soil has, and how much of other macro, micro, a lot of different types of nutrition the plants require to be able to produce a certain quantum. This is all mathematics, by the way, a certain quantum of harvest. Now, but then the fact or the truth of our agriculture is that there is no such calculation, at least in vast majority of the farmlands. Therefore, there is an invariable overutilization of fertilizers, which all of you know for sure what happens with the overutilization uh, uh, of fertilizers. It does definitely contaminate your soil, and uh, a lot of places in places like Punjab and Haryana are moving away from Basmati production to something else because their lands have become apparently infertile. So that's not what we really want our land to become, right? So the other issue is for farm, I mean, smaller farms, yes, they're there in the farm. They, they, have, they know exactly what's happening in the farm. But larger farms, the, uh, you know, they have no visibility into what's going on. See, we had this uh, issue when we were experimenting with uh, my land with, with pilots. You know what we used to do? Now, just to refer back to what the precision was all about, uh, my agronomist used to walk around with uh, tensiometer to measure moisture, uh, temperature sensor to measure the uh, soil temperature, and then the ambient temperature, humidity, pH meter, EC meter, so many meters. And what they do is they go right down uh, all the observations per plot, per gate valve. And then an agronomist used to walk around or ride around and then take a decision as to what needs to be done. And but then what really happened was, at some point, the guys who were there in the field, they know, oh, OK, you know, moisture here is always at uh, 6 AM, around 45, and uh, tomorrow 55, next day again 50, 48. So he knows what to write. Therefore, the number of times he visited and wrote started coming down, but the paper was always full. Right? Therefore, we were not able to maintain the precision. Then what we said, OK, well, uh, we'll do something. I mean, we'll probably build something which will sense all these and then uh, projected to a TV. Uh, there has to be a system with built-in agronomy intelligence, and uh, it has to monitor all the health parameters and report back. And there has to be a market linkage, an intelligence of mark, um, uh, about the market to the production, so that an optimal production is enabled. As against uh, uh, excess production and distressed sale, we just wanted to make sure there is an optimal production enabled. So these were the high level parameters with which we started building some stuff. And by the way, the goals. And these goals were measured based on our manual pilots, not even getting into the technology world. The, with the manual pilots, just by following precision agriculture, what we understood was there is a saving of 30 to 70% of water, and there is a saving of 20 to 45% in fertilizer uh, utilization, and there is a 20 to 2,000 percent increase in yield, is what we realized. Then we said, it is definitely worth candidate to build a technology around it. So then we went ahead and we, we started transitioning that into a technology. So we said there has to be IoT, obviously we all understand why there has to be an IoT, and there has to be machine learning, and it should be artificial intelligence. So these were the high level parameters with which we started building it. And then this is what we ended up uh, getting into the market, where so you have these are sensors which are planted 
into the fields and they collect real time data and not just that just for convenience convenience sake uh, what we also wanted to do some crops require a certain temperature to be maintained so we said okay so if the temperature goes beyond a certain level let's why don't we switch on a sprinkler so we did that so the crops that are sensitive to techno i mean uh, temperatures when the temperature goes beyond a certain level the sprinklers will automatically go on or the foggers automatically go on they bring the temperature down then so we we got to get some visibility about what uh, is happening in the farm because it's all happening without human intervention so then you have mobile notifications on your ios and android and uh, you have this picture is not clear on this projection but uh, this is basically your your uh, gps view of how the farm is and uh, then this is another view where it tells you what farm in inputs you have to buy for the next a week or two and then it in fact you can you can set it to auto replenish so that the tool automatically places an order to your preferred buyer and ensures the stock is made available and uh, this is how it works sensors sensing data sending it over to the cloud and then the commands coming back and uh, giving specific instructions to specific valves or tanks to do certain things and uh, that way the plants uh live as healthy as they could and then i mean for some reason the projection is bad but you know the, the i mean all of us know facebook timeline right and uh, i mean this was inspired basically by facebook timeline where uh, anything that happens in the farm either good bad ugly eventualities what happened what uh, 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 what happened what didn't happen all of that in a time slice based will be given to a farmer uh, or through the app and that's pretty much what we've done and uh, uh, i mean uh, as a, uh, a finishing note we were also recognized for what we did uh, uh, by the government, uh, central government twice last year uh, thanks so thanks guys